What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video, we're gonna be talking about intracerebral hemorrhage. But before we get started, please continue to support us. If you do really enjoy this video, you like it, it helps, support us by hitting that like button, commenting down in the comment section, and most importantly, subscribing. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into it. All right, Ninja Nerds, so let's start off talking about the etiology and pathophysiology of intracerebral hemorrhage. So what causes it? How do these particular causes lead to a bleed within the brain? So first thing, by far, one of the most common causes Causes of intracerebral hemorrhage is going to be hypertension. So when we talk about intracerebral hemorrhage, it's important to remember that there's actually kind of two subtypes. There's a non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage, and that's what we're primarily going to focus on in this lecture. And there's also a traumatic intracerebral hemorrhage. It's pretty obvious what the etiology is if it's traumatic. There's some type of blunt force trauma, penetrating trauma that's present. Let's focus on the non-traumatic causes that most common one being hypertension. So how does hypertension cause intracerebral hemorrhage? It's really straightforward. If someone has high blood pressure, right, really sustained high blood pressures, that's gonna exert a lot of forces on these blood vessel walls. As you exert a lot of force on these blood vessel walls, enough in particular areas of the brain where the vessels may be a little bit more weaker, a little bit more susceptible to rupturing, guess what happens? These vessels will then rupture as a result of this maybe acute or um, sustained or very intensely elevated blood pressure. And this can lead to these vessels rupturing and blood spilling out of these into the brain tissue. And so that is an important thing to remember. So very extremely elevated blood pressure can lead to bleeds within the brain via simple shear forces and stress on those vessel walls. What's really important though is where these bleeds most commonly occur. That's what I want you guys to remember. The most common locations for hypertensive bleeds include first your basal ganglia. So what are the different components of the basal ganglia? So your internal capsule, your putamen, your globus pilatus, which makes up the lintiform nucleus, the caudate nucleus, the thalamus. A lot of those structures are components of your basal ganglia. What's the next one? The next one is here in your pons. Your pons is a very, very important area and it is very prone to hypertensive bleeds as well. Another one is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is extremely extremely sensitive and has a very high risk of bleeds that are secondary to hypertension. And the least common one is gonna be bleeds that are near the actual cortex. So bleeds that are near the cortex. So cortical, we also call this lobar. And we say lobar because we're talking about is this the uh, frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, the temporal lobe where this bleed is occurring. So by far, most common locations include basal ganglia, pons, cerebellum, and lobar, with lobar being the least likely. Another big thing to remember is that this is by far gonna be one of the most common causes in patients usually less than 60 years of age, okay? Boom, roasted, let's move on to the next one. The next one is called cerebral amyloid angiopathy. You're probably like, what the heck? This is actually uh, interesting. So when you hear amyloid, you probably think, oh, is this like dementia stuff? Yeah, it definitely is. Amyloid proteins or amyloid beta peptides are what happens here. Here we're gonna have, let's say that here we have, here's kind of like your proteins, right? So we're gonna call this a beta amyloid peptide. What happens is these beta amyloid peptides, they deposit into the walls of these cerebral blood vessels near the cortex, near the cortex. They deposit into these blood vessels. And when they deposit into the blood vessels, they kind of weaken the blood vessels. So imagine here I have a bunch of these little beta amyloid plaques that are developing within the blood vessel. This weakens the blood vessel, makes them very fragile and prone to little micro hemorrhages and small little little ruptures, where? Where's the most common location? Bleeds at the cortex. I need you guys to remember that. So where are these bleeds most common? Most common location for these are cortical bleeds, and this is gonna be low bar bleeds. Now, when we talk about cortex, this could be, it's important to remember, this one, these bleeds, we already concluded the cerebellum as a separate one. When we talk about cerebral amyloid angiopathy, this can happen in the cerebrum, and it can happen in the cerebellum. 
Okay, so very, very important thing to remember here. Last but not least, this is the most common cause of ICH in patients greater than 60 years of age. So most common when you're greater than 60 years of age, especially if they have previous history of ICH. Also, there is a, a component of dementia related to this. So if the person also has maybe some dementia present, take that into consideration as well. So there is a dementia component present. Okay, all right, great. So we have hypertension most common, generally the most common cause, especially in those who are usually like less than 60 or any age really. But the most common cause greater than 60 is cerebral amyloid angiopathy. The next one that I want you guys to be thinking about here is coagulopathies. So this is a big one. Uh, there's a lot of drugs and medications that are involved in this. So coagulopathy. We particularly see this with anticoagulation or some type of uh, measure that we'll talk about, anti-thrombotic um, uh, antiplatelet agents, anticoagulants, um, fibrinolytic medications. We'll talk about all these. But what happens is, this coagulopathy, usually you put someone on anticoagulants, right? So you, they're on anticoagulants. Let's just say here as the example. Anticoagulants is basically you're decreasing the coagulation cascade, right? So when you give someone anticoagulation, you're decreasing the coagulation uh, cascade, if you will. And if you decrease the coagulation cascade, that is a component of what? Hemostasis, so you decrease hemostasis. Let's say that someone has little micro tears just from the daily wear and tear on those blood vessels. So they develop like little, you know, tiny little micro tears, which is pretty common in individuals. Usually what happens is we have particular measures like hemostasis and the coagulation cascade that help to plug up those little holes. But if someone's on anticoagulation, especially if they're on super therapeutic levels, this anticoagulants are going to affect them being able to properly plug up those holes and lead to hemorrhages or a little seeping of blood out of these blood vessels. And so that's really important to remember. So coagulopathy is another one. And there's a bunch of different types of medications. Some that we'll talk about are gonna be warfarin. It's gonna be a big one. The other one is gonna be heparin. We'll talk about DOAX. We'll talk about TPA. And there's even the, uh, the last one which could be um, aspirin and clopidogrel. Okay, which are your antiplatelet agents. Okay, the last thing that you want to think about is if it's not anticoagulant related, is there a cirrhosis or liver injury, or there, is there acute liver failure, chronic liver failure, where they can't make procoagulants? So they can't make the coagulation proteins. So you're either giving drugs that are inhibiting the procoagulants or the liver's not making the procoagulants. So think about that as well. If someone has liver failure, that could lead to what? A decrease in the procoagulants, okay? So here, we'll put that like this. A decrease in procoagulants. Like which ones? Factors two, factor seven, factor nine, factor 10, uh, protein C, protein S, all of those, and the same kind of process here occurs, okay? And so then you can get bleeds related to that. So we have hypertension, we have cerebral amyloid angiopathy, and we have coagulopathies either related to anticoagulants or severe liver failure. Let's move into the next one. All right, so what's another potential cause of intracerebral hemorrhage? Hemorrhagic transformation is a big one to be thinking about. So we got hypertension, we got cerebral amyloid angiopathy, we got coagulopathies, hemorrhagic transformation Information. What could this be due to? Think about it simply. Someone had an ischemic stroke. They had an ischemic stroke, maybe they got TPA, and what happened is they converted that ischemic infarct into a hemorrhagic infarct. Or they had an ischemic stroke, they didn't get any intervention, but they had such a big infarct that we reperfused that area maybe by pushing their blood pressure up too high and we just converted that ischemic infarct into a hemorrhagic infarct by bleeding into that infarcted bed. Either way, there's a transformation of an ischemic infarct into a hemorrhage. So what does this usually do to? Someone had an ischemic stroke, so we'll put an ischemic infarct, 
And what happened is, is that converted into an ICH. What could be the reasons for that? One is maybe they got TPA, and that TPA just was enough to kind of, again, weaken the integrity of those blood vessels enough that they couldn't actually uh, sustain that and they cause a bleed, right? So it could just be from the TPA that caused that because again, TPA is designed to be able to make the blood thin, to break up clots, and so they have a high bleeding risk when you give a drug like that. The other thing is that they develop a reperfusion injury. So what happens is, let's say that maybe they didn't get any TPA, um, or maybe they did get TPA, and you just don't control their blood pressure as well. And so what happens is the blood pressure is maybe a little bit too high and you push too much blood into an area where the vessels are already weak because of an underlying ischemia and infarction. We'll explain how that happens. But the blood vessel is just really weak and you push the blood pressure a little bit too high into those weak vessels, they rupture and cause a bleed into that infarcted bed. So how does this kind of mechanism happen? So really what happens is, let's say here I have some neurons here. So here I'm gonna have maybe some neurons and these neurons become damaged because they had an ischemic infarct there. What happens is they release a lot of inflammation. This basically leads to a lot of inflammation, right? Because of their injury, there's a lot of inflammation. And that inflammation causes like a lot of neutrophils to come to the area, causes a lot of reactive oxygen species and free radicals and stuff like that to come to the area. And that inflammation starts really acting and wreaking havoc on these vessel walls. And so those vessel walls just become relatively weak. Then you give someone TPA after they've had an ischemic infarct. So the ischemic infarct, right, of these neurons lead to inflammation. Lots of inflammation weakens the vessels. You push the blood pressure a little bit too high into those weak vessels, or you give them TPA and it just, again, causes more weakening of the vessels. Those little bad boys rupture and you bleed into that infarcted bed. And that's where you can get a hemorrhagic transformation, okay? So we got hypertension, cerebral amyloid, we got coagulopathy, we got hemorrhagic transformation. The next one is malignancy. There's some type of metastatic cause. Not usually, usually the most common cause of these ICHs is a metastatic cause rather than primary. So malignancy, you gotta know where are these actual, where are these cancer cells coming from? They started somewhere, they got into the brain, they broke down the blood brain barrier, and I'll explain what that means, which caused blood to seep into these areas around the tumor. What are the tumors that you have to be thinking about that were the original source that spread to the brain? Big one papillary thyroid cancer. So that's one. So which one is it? The first one here is going to be thinking about thyroid. So papillary thyroid cancer is the first one. The other one is lung cancer, particularly small cell lung cancer. The other one is renal cell carcinoma. So renal cell carcinoma is another one. The other one is melanoma. Melanoma is, a, melanoma is a son of a gun, right? So this one can really be a nasty type of cancer that can spread. And then the last one here is choriocarcinoma. So let's actually write this one out, choriocarcinoma. Okay, so this can definitely plague like the uterus and reproductive organs as well. So what happens is these cancers, Right? Some of the cancer cells spread from these different primary locations. And what they do is they actually infiltrate the brain tissue, right? So they're gonna infiltrate the brain tissue. When they infiltrate the brain tissue, what they do is they disrupt the blood brain barrier. You guys remember what the blood brain barrier is made up of? You get the endothelial cells, then you get the basal lamina, and then what are those little glial cells? The astrocytes, right? Well, what these guys do is they really damage and disrupt that blood brain barrier. And so now you don't have a proper blood-brain barrier. And what is the blood-brain barrier designed to do? Control things leaving the blood and coming into the neural tissues. If you don't have good control, guess what's gonna happen? Some things are gonna leave the blood and enter into those neural tissues. So you start kind of destroying that blood-brain barrier and blood can start seeping in around. So imagine here would be the mass that came from one of these cancers. There would be kind of a bleed that would surround that mass, okay? Because of it disrupting the blood-brain barrier. So what do these things do? Let's actually write that down. They disrupt the blood-brain barrier.
Okay, so that gives us the next cause, which is malignancy. Let's move on. The next one is cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. That's a heck of a name, also abbreviated CVST. Cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. It's basically a DVT of the brain. That's literally what it is. So you have different types of veins in the brain, right? So you have like what's called the superior sagittal sinus, the inferior sagittal sinus, the transverse, the sigmoid, the straight sinus, all of these crazy sinuses. Someone can develop a clot, a venous clot within these veins, and it can literally lead to a bleed. I'll explain how that happens. But generally, what is a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis? It is a clot in the, uh, the venous system of the brain. Okay, how does this, now, okay, let's talk about one more thing before that. So we know it's a clot in the venous system. What in the heck causes the clot in the venous system? It's really any kind of like hypercoagulable condition, whether that hypercoagulability, so hypercoagulable condition. So it's any kind of hypercoagulable condition. This hypercoagulability, it could be due to an underlying like inherited disorder. So we're not going to write down all of them, but for example, this could be things like factor five Leiden. This could be things like antiphospholipid syndrome. This could be things like antithrombin three deficiency and so on and so forth. But it could also be acquired things. So sometimes if people are on oral contraceptives or if they're pregnant, these are all things that can also kind of make them a little bit more hypercoagulable and at risk for forming clots within that venous system in the brain. Now let's talk about how these clots actually do lead to um, basically a hemorrhage. So if you imagine here, imagine there's like this arterial thing that's eventually feeding into this vein here, right? So there's say that there's kind of like, you'll have a capillary network. But let's say that blood will come in through the artery and then leave out through the vein. Right? If you have a clot that's obstructing the venous drainage, sometimes what can happen is the blood is actually going to have to like, so you might not be able to get blood past this. And so what happens is this may plump up the vessels that are proximal to wherever that clot is in the venous system. And these suckers may plump up a little bit enough that they can rupture. And then what can happen is they can bleed into the brain tissue, but it's usually near the edges of the brain tissue, like near the edges of the cortex. So usually whenever you see like a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, it produces a very characteristic bleed that's usually near the edges of the cortex. So again, that's kind of the basic way that cerebral venous sinus thrombosis leads to an ICH or a, a, a basically an intracerebral hemorrhage. There's a clot in the venous system. Venous congestion can lead to hemorrhaging of the venous system, some of the arterial system there, and bleeds near the cortical regions. And it's usually due to some type of hypercoagulable type of condition there. Okay, so that's cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So we got hypertension, we got cerebral amyloid, we got coagulopathy, we have a hemorrhagic transformation, malignancy, DVT of the brain, the last one is vascular abnormalities. You see this in younger individuals. So first things first is you see this in younger um, patients. And this is actually um, a vascular malformation referred to as an AVM. So let's write this above it so that we know that this is in younger patients. What is this thing here called? This is called an AVM, an arteriovenous malformation. So this is present in younger individuals. And it's basically this abnormal arterial capillary network. So there's not a, a complete formation of that microcirculation. So what happens is usually you have an arterial, it branches into your capillaries, goes into the capillary bed, drains into a venule, and then to a vein. This one, you kind of have like this ab abnormal connection between the arterial and the vein. And it creates like this abnormal ball or nidus that's just super susceptible to, if there's any kind of increase in pressure, it's gonna rupture. And so that can cause a bleed there as well. So usually this is a kind of, a more commonly in younger individuals, and it's basically an abnormality within their vascular channels. Okay, the other abnormality here is something I want you guys to think about, and this is what's called a mycotic aneurysm. So you can have ICHs that can be due to um, 
aneurysms in general. And there, so if we had, for example, let's say that we had an aneurysm, there's different types of aneurysms. You can have saccular aneurysms, fusiform aneurysms, and mycotic aneurysms. So this is one that I really want you to remember. We'll talk about aneurysms, those rupturing, and what's called subarachnoid hemorrhages, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhages. But for right now, the big aneurysm that I want you to remember that can cause ICH is called a mycotic aneurysm. And what happens with mycotic aneurysm is someone may have what's called infective endocarditis. So what do we call this? Infective, we'll put I, endocarditis. And in infective endocarditis, they develop these kind of like vegetations, like these little septic vegetations on the valves. And what happens is these little vegetations can break off from the left atrium, left ventricle, into the aortic system, go up through the carotid system, so now follow this bad boy through, into this actual cerebral circulation, and go here where it kind of nestles into these vessels. And what happens is, this is basically little septic structures, this little infective uh, little vegetations that get lodged into the cerebral vessels and cause damage to those vessels and cause them to balloon up. And then if someone has kind of this little ballooning and weakening of the blood vessel, what can happen if maybe there's just a little brief rise in pressure? These little bad boys can rupture and lead to bleeding into the brain tissue, which is gonna cause their ICH, okay? And so usually mycotic aneurysms are secondary to an infective endocarditis. So now let's talk about the clinical features of intracerebral hemorrhage. So the first one, and probably one of the most common symptoms, is especially if there's a cortical bleed, right, or a lobar bleed, they can present with a headache. The reason why is if the bleed's near the cortex or near the lobe, like it's involving particularly a cortical region or a lobar region, it's close to the meninges and they can agitate the meninges. And you know the meninges are supplied by cranial nerves, like the trigeminal nerve, and so that can send signals via the sensory fibers of the trigeminal nerve to the trigeminal uh, nucleus, up via the trigeminal thalamic tract, and cause this pain, basically, within the head region. So, headache is a very common clinical manifestation or clinical feature that can be seen in individuals with ICH, especially if the bleed is cortical or lobar. And again, that mechanism is via agitation of the meninges, activation of the sensory fibers of particular cranial nerves, activating the trigeminal thalamic tract. Now, we're not gonna go through all of the different types of neurodeficits because we talk about that in stroke syndromes because it's the same kind of concept if someone has a bleed in a particular area where they also maybe comparatively had an ischemic stroke, they can present somewhat similar. So if you guys wanna know more about these focal neural deficits, go check out our video. We're gonna have a link up here to go watch the stroke syndromes. Okay, but they will have different types of focal neural deficits, maybe aphasia, maybe weakness on one side, maybe gaze preferences, maybe sensory loss, so on and so forth. Okay, the next particular clinical feature that I want you guys to be aware of is that these individuals can also have high intracranial pressure. Whenever you have a bleed, there's something called the Monroe Kelly Doctrine, where inside of the skull, the skull is kind of a fixed thing, it doesn't really expand. You have brain, blood, and CSF. If you have more of one of those things, it's gonna increase the space now crowded within that skull and the pressure inside of the cranium is gonna increase. If we got a lot of blood, more blood than we should have inside of that skull, it's gonna increase the intracranial pressure. So you can develop symptoms from this bleed. Okay, so this is gonna cause high intracranial pressure. What are some of the symptoms of high intracranial pressure? They're relatively generic, but one of the big ones is nausea and vomiting, okay? And this may be due to like a stimulation or compression of things in like the, the chemo trigger zone, the area postrema, which is in the brainstem. So maybe some brainstem compression. This also could lead to kind of a decreasing level of consciousness, so L-O-C. So maybe like an altered mental status, they're really becoming sleepy. You're trying to say, hey, you know, wake up, wake up, wake up, when you're trying to examine them, and they're just not waking up as well. The other thing is they can start to have cranial nerve deficits. What do I mean? Maybe their pupils are starting to become, one's larger than the other. Maybe it's not reactive to light. Maybe you're testing their corneal reflexes, they're not reacting. Maybe you're trying to see if they have a cough reflex and it's not there. And the other thing 
is they may start showing signs of posturing. So you have the different things like decerebrate posturing, decorticate posturing that may become a little bit more evident with high intracranial pressures. And the last thing is, you guys already know this, there's a particular triad called the Cushing's triad. What is the Cushing's triad? I want you guys to remember that it's a high BP, it is a low heart rate, and it's a low respiratory rate or irregular respirations as well. Okay, that gives us the big clinical features. Now that we understand how intracerebral hemorrhages can present to us, let's now talk about how we diagnose it. So, first thing, the most important, if you only had one kind of test that you could use to determine if someone has an ICH, it's a image, a stat CT scan of the head. So by far the most important thing to obtain is a stat CT of the head. So stat CT, generally like a non-contrast CT scan of the head. And this will help you to identify if there is a bleed present. So it can tell you if there's an ICH, it can tell you if there's any midline shift. What does that mean? So some of the brain, so from this bleed, you start having some of the brain tissue pushing to the opposite side, maybe causing like herniation syndromes to be present. You also wanna note, is there any hydrocephalus? So sometimes when you get a lot of these bleeds, you can get hydrocephalus because some of the blood from here starts extending into the ventricles. And so they get what's called hydrocephalus due to IVH, or intraventricular hemorrhage. So that's one thing we could do. You could get a CT angio if you wanna look for like a vascular, like a CTA, MRA, something like that, if you're looking for vascular abnormalities. So that could be another image you could obtain, is maybe a CTA or an MRA if you're looking for particular types of like vascular causes, like you know anomalies of some form. For example, you're maybe looking for a mycotic aneurysm, maybe you're looking for um, maybe some type of AVM or something like that. You can also do like angiography as well, but the CTA is a pretty quick one, relatively easy, if you, especially if you're getting a CT scan. The other thing that you can do is an MRI. This is actually a, a relatively significant thing that you should be able to obtain after you've, you know, pretty much you got the first diagnosis with the CT. Later on, after you stabilize them, you can get an MRI. And an MRI, also, MRV, you should add on, okay? And we'll explain why in a second. MRI, what I like to look for is I look at pretty much like one sequence, really. I look at the SWI. So the SWI is a particular sequence that tells me if there's any like iron or blood that's kind of sitting in a particular area of the brain. And so an SWI will come up basically showing like these like black spots really. So it'll show like little black holes, if you will, that tell me that there was blood. There's blood in this area. There is a hemorrhage in this area. And that is important if you're trying to really see, okay, do they have a hemorrhage? You can obviously tell that from a CT scan, but remember I told you there was a particular thing called cerebral amyloid angiopathy. You want to get a SWI because if someone has tons, and I mean tons and tons and tons of little bleeds all over their cortex and their cerebellum, and they're older, greater than 60, what do you think that could be indicative of? Cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And the other thing we said is an MRV. Why is an MRV gonna be helpful for me? What was that condition? So we have an MRI, it just kind of gives us a look at the brain. No contrast, there's not, you're not filling the vessels. CTA, MRA, you can fill the arteries to look at those, to see if there's any abnormalities there. MRV is you're filling contrast through the cerebral veins. What was one of the etiologies as a potential cause of hemorrhage? Cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, right? So look there to find any cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. All right, I think that's a pretty good start, wouldn't you? All right, let's move on. We got our imaging, the big imaging. Next thing, we found an ICH, we've looked for some vascular anomalies to help us to find the cause. We did like some other MRI studies to look to see if there is an ICH, cerebral amyloid, CVST, all that good stuff. What was another particular cause? Malignancy. So sometimes what I may do is, I can obviously maybe get an ultrasound of the thyroid. I could do that to look to see if there's any mass there. 
But the common biggest thing, thing to look for here is to do what's called a CT. You can do what's called a CT of the chest. Can help you to look at the, the, the lungs to look to see if there is any particular like lung mass there. You can get a CT, and this is all one order. So for example, you would get a CT of the chest, abdomen, and of the pelvis. And if you see a, you know, a mass within the lungs, that could be a cause. A mass within the kidneys, that could be a cause. A mass within the uterus or other reproductive organs, that could be a cause of their malignancy. So if they have a bleed and they're imaging and you go and you find a mass somewhere else that it metastasized from, you now have a cause or a primary source. And then again, check their skin for melanoma, you know, palpate and do ultrasound for the, the thyroid as well. So I think that's a pretty good kind of test for that. What else could we do? We could get an echo. We get an echo. Why, why, why do I want to get an echo, Zach? So remember we said infective endocarditis, you form little infective vegetations on those valves. They bust off, they get stuck in a cerebral vessel, cause a mycotic aneurysm. Look for that. Do an echo. So we can do a transthoracic echo or we can do a transesophageal echo. And what we're looking for is, is there any kind of like septic emboli that's present? And we'll talk later because the other thing that we can add on to help in aiding in our diagnosis is, did the person have a fever? So what could add to that? Did they have a fever? Do they have any IV drug abuse? And then check the blood cultures because usually blood cultures are positive, okay? And then if they have a murmur, do they have a new murmur that you heard whenever you were auscultating them? So I think this is kind of the big stuff to think about is images, CT, you can get um, arterial images, venous images. A big thing is MRI, looking at that SWI. You suspect malignancy, CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. You suspect a septic emboli, infective endocarditis. Echo with the other associated blood cultures that we'll talk about in a second. Let's talk about some labs that can help us. So now, we got our images. Let's talk about some labs that we'd wanna order and what these things could tell us and help aiding in our diagnosis and maybe more specifically, the etiology, the causes of this uh, diagnosis. Because really the main thing about the diagnosis, we get a CT, that's gonna tell us what we need. Figuring out the etiology of the ICH is kinda gonna be the extra things that we can get from other images and labs. So labs, what do we do? Well, it's important because you want to be holistic. You want to see CBC, right? Start off with a CBC. Why a CBC? Because this can tell you if the person has any severe anemia, right? Anemia, if they're, maybe they're bleeding a lot. Do they have any thrombocytopenia? Uh, so basically, do they have any very low platelets? That's another thing that could be important from this as well. Another lab that I would obtain is a CMP. So a CMP is gonna be helpful. It'll tell you, remember we said that one of the things could be coagulopathies? So coagulopathy could be due to the anticoagulation. We'd have to ask them about their history. Do you guys take any anticoagulation? But the other thing about a CMP is it's gonna tell us, is there any elevation in their AST, their ALT, their ALKFOS? And maybe this is the reason why they have a, a, a coagulopathy is because they have severe liver failure and they're not making procoagulants. So something to think about. The other thing is, for the most part, it shouldn't always determine whether or not you add contrast in a study. If you need the contrast, it's important for the study, you should get it. Um, but sometimes a CMP is helpful because it tells you about your renal function, tells you if there's any elevated BUN, tells you if there's any elevated creatinine, because that could come into play whenever you're gonna give them contrast. But again, don't get too bogged down in that, okay? The other thing is coags. We should check a PT. We should check a PTT, and we should check an INR, right? These are things that are important because if someone has maybe an elevated PTT, we gotta figure out why do they have an elevated PTT? Or if they have an elevated INR, why do they have an elevated INR? Is it due to a coagulopathy? Or is it due because they're taking warfarin? Do they have an elevated PTT because they're on heparin and they were just on too much heparin and that's why they bled? Thinking about those potential causes, thinking about these from the, the labs can be helpful in aiding in what the cause is and how you're going to treat them, okay? So we got a CBC, we got a CMP, we got some coags there.
It's also important. Remember we were talking about someone having infective endocarditis? And also, there's another risk factor. We didn't talk about some of the risk factors, but there is risk factors for ICH. Anytime someone is on any kind of like drug like cocaine, any methamphetamines, alcohol itself really is a risk factor for bleeds to happen. So it's important to also obtain a urine drug screen in someone for a couple reasons. One, it's important just to make sure that there is no thing, uh, there's nothing that you're missing as potential risk factors. That way, if they do recover and they do um, recover from this bleed, you can try to prevent them from developing a bleed in the future by addressing these issues, like avoiding tr things like methamphetamines and, and so on and so forth. So basically looking for any tox stuff. So for example, are they on cocaine? Because that is a very important risk factor. Was it positive for alcohol? Because that's another important risk factor, okay? The other thing that you should always obtain, it's a quick little easy test, is a point of care glucose. A point of care glucose is a quick little easy thing to look to see if they have any hypoglycemia. So a point of care glucose. It's important to obtain to look to see if they have any low glucose, hypoglycemia, or high glucose, hyperglycemia, okay? What else? A blood culture, that's, oh, that's another reason you should get a urine drug screen. Because what if somebody is an IV drug abuser and you don't actually know it because it's not someone that's not told to you or the person's basically non-responsive and they can't tell you that they use drugs or you just can't find it. Maybe on the tox screen they're positive for heroin. That could maybe lead you to think, ooh, do they have infective endocarditis? Maybe that's the cause for their bleed. At the same time, you should also get blood cultures, especially if they were febrile, especially if they have a new murmur, especially if your echo suggests potentially some vegetations there. Um, so definitely doing something like that, like obtaining blood cultures, may be helpful to rule out um, infective endocarditis as a cause for those septic emboli. The other thing is, remember we said that cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, we may be able to pick it up from the MRV, but the thing that we gotta think about is what was the cause of someone developing cerebral venous sinus thrombosis? Hypercoagulable conditions, right? And so maybe doing a hypercoagulable workup may be somewhat beneficial in this scenario as well. So checking for hypercoagulable workup. And we are not gonna go through all of these. What you can do is, we'll mention a couple, you can check the factor five levels, you can check their antithrombin three levels, you can check their protein C and S, and there's so many other ones that you can check. We won't go through all of these. But checking some of those levels to look to see is there a hypercoagulable condition that is causing them to form a, uh, basically a DVT in the brain, and that's why they developed a, a bleed. Okay, so that can aid um, in your diagnosis as well, particularly the causes. The other thing and kind of the last thing, we didn't really mention it as causes because they're really, really, really relatively rare. Um, and it kind of goes along with the vascular malformations. The two big ones that I wanted you to know was the AVMs and the kind of like aneurysms, like mycotic aneurysms, berry aneurysms. But another really low in the differential, it should really be low, is any kind of cause of vasculitis. So sometimes vasculitides are also susceptible to the blood vessels kind of rupturing as well. So is there you know, a, a suspected vasculitis? And so again, autoimmune cause. What can you do for that one? Check an ESR, check a CRP, check an ANCA, check an ANA, so on and so forth we can do there, right? Is it infectious? How do I determine if it's infectious? Well, think about the causes. Look for TB, look for syphilis, look for varicella zoster virus, right? So you can do like, the uh, interferon assays, you can check the VDRL, uh, RPR, you can check a PCR for VZV. And then the other one is, is there like a primary CNS vasculitis? That is the cause of this one. And this actually would somewhat require a biopsy to kind of confirm that. So these are things to be thinking about of how you're gonna go about diagnosing ICH and figuring out the causes of ICH. I hope this helps. Now let's move on to the treatment. All right, engineers, so now let's talk about the treatment of intracerebral hemorrhage. So this is the biggest, you know, really, really kind of like you need to know this stuff. You have to have this part down. So first thing, 
When someone has a really big WAP and ICH that has midline shift and increased intracranial pressures, there's always the concern, can they protect their airway? Especially if they have this declining level of consciousness and they're not able to kind of like follow commands and to, you know, really they aren't completely oriented to person, place, time and things like that. So you should have a very low threshold for intubating somebody, especially if they have a very, very large bleed with a declining mental status. So airway, in every emergent situation, ABCs, right? So airway breathing circulation is always kind of the best steps here. So why is an airway a problem? Well, think about this. You have all these respiratory centers here in your brainstem, right? Pons, medulla. And these basically are important because the nerves that are coming from here via the intercostal nerves and the phrenic nerve supply muscles that help to aid in breathing via your respiratory rate and your respiratory depth. If there is compression because there's high ICPs, maybe you have a bleed right here, and this bleed is causing some, some com compression of that brain stem, that's going to injure these areas and decrease your ability to generate uh, respiratory you know, breaths, particularly rates and, and depth. So important to think about that. So when someone has these large bleeds, you need to protect their airway. How do we do that? Have a low threshold for intubation. So sometimes intubation may be a very important thing to do in these patients. And when you intubate them and you put them on a mechanical ventilator, there's different types of modes. There's all these different types of modes. We'll cover this in another lecture, but maybe CMV, maybe ASV. Uh, so continuous mechanical ventilation, adaptive support ventilation. But the biggest thing is that you want to control their ability to breathe. And so we set particular things and settings here. So you set like your FiO2, you set your PEEP, and these two things control your oxygen saturation. You can also control your tidal volume, you control your respiratory rates, which helps you to determine your CO2 concentrations. So very important thing to be thinking about whenever you're intubating somebody. Also, when you're intubating somebody, it helps because high intracranial pressures, you wanna control their breathing, and you also want to try to sedate these patients a little bit because these sedation meds also help to lower basal metabolic rates, lower the actual oxygen consumption of the brain. And so sometimes intubation allows for someone to be able to be sedated because you can, can protect their airway. So allowing for sedation um, is also helpful. So things like propofol um, or Versed, uh, also known as midazolam, let's write that down here, midazolam, can be helpful to kind of really uh, sedate the patient, keep them comfortable, and help to control their uh, potentially elevated intracranial pressures. So protecting their airway with mechanical ventilation is very important. What's the next thing? So after we've stabilized their airway, it's kind of, and they're in their breathing, it's circulation. So blood pressure is a huge thing. It is definitely one of the big, most, most important things to control. So, when someone has a bleed, you wanna prevent the expansion of that already present bleed. So keeping a blood pressure goal, systolic blood pressure less than 160 millimeters of mercury, sometimes it can be even, if you wanna have a more stringent goal, less than 140 millimeters of mercury. But we're controlling their blood pressure with particular antihypertensives. So things that are gonna be like what? Well, the best thing to be thinking about is nicardipine. Nicardipine, you have very good control over blood pressure. Other things are gonna be things like labetalol. So labetalol is a, a, a beta, so nicardipine is a calcium channel blocker, labetalol is a beta blocker. You also can use things like um, enalapril, Okay, and actually it's called enalapronat, and this is also IV. So all of these are these IV forms. You wanna use IV forms, and when someone's this sick, so that you get very good, blood, better blood pressure control. Also, there's other drugs that you can give. Sometimes you can even give furosemide, especially if someone is actually volume overloaded. Um, that may also be helpful in IV form as well. So either way, controlling the blood pressure by whatever means you can, particularly via these IV methods, and then later, you can use oral antihypertensives. So anti-hypertension meds once you kind of get them a little bit more stable. So you have a, you, a plethora of options, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, you have also your dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like amlodipine, nifedipine, you have other drugs like beta blockers. Um, so beta blockers, things like um, labetalol are other options. And then you even have alpha-2 agonists, 
uh, things like uh, clonidine. So it's important to get good control of their blood pressure, less than 160. And again, you can use IV drugs and then once able, oral antihypertensive medications for prolonged blood pressure control is also very important. Okay, what else? So control their airway, intubate, mechanically ventilate, sedate. Blood pressure control, less than 160, more stringent goals, say even less than 140. The next thing is, do they have a coagulopathy? So reversal of an underlying coagulopathy is extremely high yield. So think about the anticoagulation, right? So first thing, are they taking a particular medication like warfarin? If they're taking warfarin, you need to know the reversal agent. What is the reversal agent for warfarin? Well, the first thing is you need to give IV vitamin K. Generally, you give this like 10. So you're gonna give 10 milligrams of IV vitamin K. The other thing that you give is what's called PCC, prothrombin complex concentrate. And it's important to remember that this is based on the INR. We're not gonna go and write all of these down. I'll quickly list like, for example, if the INR is between 1.5 to 1.9, you get 15 units per kg. If it's two to four, you give 25 units per kg. If it's four to six, you give 35 units per kg. And if it's greater than six INR, you give 50 units per kg of PCC. Another option is that there is another option of what's called FFP, fresh frozen plasma, but generally PCC is preferred. So warfarin, what do you do? Again, remember you reverse it with IV vitamin K and PCC based upon their INR. The next one is heparin. So if someone is on a heparin infusion, particularly they have the heparin infusion within the past three hours, you can give a drug called protamine sulfate. And protamine sulfate, you can give this, there's a particular conversion factor for this one. Generally, it's like a 50 milligram kind of max that you can give. And that can reverse the heparin, especially if they've kind of finished this within the past, or they've been on it with at least the past three hours. The next one is your DOAX. And there's a couple different types of DOAX or NOAX, if you wanna know them. But the big thing to remember is a Pixaban, and rivaroxaban, and there's also a doxaban. But these two drugs, you reverse these, there is no like specific reversal agent as compared to these other ones up here, but we've seen somewhat of a decent efficacy um, reversing these with PCC, so prothrombin complex concentrate. And again, this one ranges as well, this can go anywhere from 20 to 50 units per kg, but that's one option. The other option is there is somewhat of a newer drug, there's not a ton of evidence to support its use, but indexinet alpha is believed to be a drug that can reverse these DOACs as well. There's one more DOAC that you have to remember because it does have a very specific type of reversal agent. So the other one is called dabigatran. So uh, apixaban and rivaroxaban, if you really want to remember, these are 10A inhibitors, factor 10A inhibitors. Dabigatran is a factor 2A inhibitor or also known as a thrombin inhibitor. And this one you actually reverse with a very specific like a monoclonal antibody called Ida Rikizumab. Okay? So warfarin reverse with IV vitamin K, PCC or FFP, heparin protamine sulfate, DOAX if it's the uh, 10A inhibitors, it's PCC or indexinet alpha. If it's dabigatran, which is a thrombin inhibitor, it's idorakizumab. All right, well, what about TPA? Well, if you guys watched our ischemic stroke lecture, you already know what we do for TPA. If they're still getting the TPA infusion, you stop the TPA infusion, but you give them what's called tranexamic acid, also known as TXA, a one gram bolus and then maybe another gram eight uh, uh, hours later. You can also give what's called cryo, precipitate, maybe up to 10 units, plus or minus platelets that can be transfused in these patients, okay?
The next thing, <laughs> as if there wasn't enough already, is if someone is on antiplatelet agents. Now, now, now here's the last thing with these. Antiplatelet uh, platelet agents include which ones? So this is your aspirin, which is a pretty common one, and clopidogrel, all right, which is also known as Plavix. So these two agents, there's actually not a lot of evidence to support the use of platelet transfusions. Okay, the only time where platelet transfusions may be utilized is if the person is getting a neurosurgical intervention. So neurosurgical interventions, you actually wanna have platelets that are greater than 100,000. So if they have less than 100,000, they've been on antiplatelet agents, you can consider giving like a platelet transfusion. Another option besides this is also, there's what's called a DDAVP, which is also known as desmopressin. Um, so this is another option to give in someone who has antiplatelet agents. Big, big, big thing to remember, there's not a lot of evidence to suggest actually using these things um, if someone took an antiplatelet agent and they developed a bleed. It's mainly the ones above that we would reverse. This one, not a lot of evidence to support. Okay, we've, su we've tr supported their airway. We've controlled their blood pressure. We've reversed the coagulopathy. Now what? Let's control the cerebral edema and elevated intracranial pressures. All right, so now let's talk about how we treat cerebral edema, elevated intracranial pressure that's seen in ICHs. So whenever someone has an ICH, they have probably a big midline shift, a big old pocket of blood. It's important to know kind of the treatment measures that we would go about within this patient. So what do we do? So the first thing you really, really need to know is, is sometimes neurosurgical intervention is the big, big thing here. Um, intervention. So what are these neurosurgical interventions that we could employ for this patient? So the first thing is, so sometimes if you have a pretty decent sized bleed, right? Sometimes what we, what we don't want is we don't want this bleed causing so much midline shift that you start trying to push parts of the brain tissue downwards onto the brainstem causing herniation. So what we do is, is take the bone off where that bleed maybe is near that area so that the brain can actually swell outside of that actual calvarial bone flap area and not downwards onto the brain stem. So we can do kind of a decompressive crany, okay? Now, if the bleed is super tentorial, there's been a couple different trials, like the stitch trials that look at blood within the super tentorial, so above the tentorium, up in the, these, these portions of the cerebrum, versus infratentorial, kind of be like posterior fossa where the cerebellum and brainstem is. There's not a lot of support to say you can you know, evacuate and pull out blood within the supertentorial region, but sometimes it's still done. There's a lot more support for saying pull and evacuate out the blood that is actually within the infratentorial region because it's such a small space and it can smash on the brainstem and cause really significant hydrocephalus. So sometimes not only will you can decompress them, but you can sometimes evacuate some of that actual blood. The other thing is if this, this blood extends into those little cavities, right? So you have the different cavities. Let's just say I draw a cavity here. This cavity, let's just say, is the fourth ventricle. Some of that blood coming from that hemorrhage can extend into these ventricles and block up the flow of cerebral spinal fluid. And so that, that cerebral spinal fluid can actually back up and start causing those ventricles to balloon up. And that can cause hydrocephalus. So sometimes putting in what's called an external ventricular drain, an EVD, can help with the hydrocephalus. So this is important in situations with IVH, intraventricular hemorrhage, and hydrocephalus. The next thing is we can employ particular medical management. So there's some medical uh, kind of like interventions that we can employ for these patients. So one of the things that we can do is we can make the blood really salty and just dehydrate the crap out of the normal healthy brain tissue to just decrease the amount of space inside of the brain. And so we can use different types of salty kind of measures. So we can use drugs like 3% hypertonic saline or 
23.4% hypertonic saline and really make the blood salty. Maybe you approach a sodium goal of like 150 to 155 and that's your goal to make the blood so salty that you draw water out of maybe this area here where there's healthy brain tissue and an intact blood brain barrier. Another medication that we can give besides like these hypertonic salines is there's also the option of mannitol. Okay, so mannitol generally like it's a 25% solution and this comes in various different doses that you can give. But mannitol is another drug that you can give to kind of, again, dehydrate the brain, pulling some of the fluid away from this healthy brain tissues to kind of dehydrate the brain a little bit. So these are kind of the basic measurements that you can utilize for cerebral edema and increased ICP. The next thing that I want us to talk about here is seizures. Man, oh man, bleeds that are near the cortex are very high risk for seizures. So these bleeds create a very significant kind of epileptogenic focus that can lead to maybe focal seizures. So these individuals can maybe develop focal seizures and depending upon where that is, it could be very specific. So for example, if it was like in the left like uh, front, like maybe here the frontal or parietal lobe, maybe you start developing like some twitching on that right side of the body or something of that nature. So that you can develop focal seizures. Now sometimes these focal seizures can actually generalize and you can develop generalized seizures that are full on like tonic clonic, okay? Another thing is sometimes these bleeds can not only cause focal seizures, generalized tonic clonic seizures, but they can cause these types of seizures that are really not that obvious. They're not just flailing around or twitching in certain parts of their body. It can lead to what's called non-convulsive status epilepticus. And this is one where they just really are just kind of like a decreased mental status. They're not super involved. They're not really, they may be aphasic. Maybe they have gaze preferences and stuff like that. And you actually need a continuous EEG to really kind of diagnose this type. Either way, it's really important to treat these seizures with anti-epileptic medications, okay? And so there's many different types. We're not gonna go through all of them, but I want you to know that there's some medications that we can give such as phenytoin, phosphenytoin, valproate, levetiracetam, lacosamide, and we can even accelerate that to really intense sedation agents like propofol and midazolam, and even if we have to, uh, barbiturates in those situations as well. Okay, so that covers the seizures. The last thing that I want us to, well, as we get towards the last thing is kind of the ICH prevention. So there's different things that we talked about as potential causes of ICH that we want to prevent from happening in the future. And what are those things? And what do we say is the most common cause <laughs> of someone developing an ICH? Hypertension, right? So we need to have better, um, so control of someone's hypertension. And so it's very simple, just maximize their antihypertensive meds. And so that's very, very important because if you have someone who develops a bleed and it was due to hypertension, you really wanna maximize their antihypertensive medicines to keep their blood pressure lower so they don't develop another bleed somewhere. The other thing that you wanna be thinking about here is, what if somebody had an ischemic infarct that can transformed or a, a kind of a, a converted into a hemorrhagic bleed and it was due to an embolic source? So you want to be thinking about anticoagulation sometimes in those situations. So sometimes, sometimes anticoagulation may be needed. Um, but here's the big reason why. There's really one condition that I want us to know this for. Anticoagulation there's a thrombus that forms within your veins. What was that called? Cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. So cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, you have to anticoagulate even if the person does develop a bleed from that. You have to prevent that clot from continuing to develop. So you wanna start breaking down that clot, preventing future clots with giving them anticoagulation like heparin or uh, different types of heparin. There's unfractionated, there's low molecular weight heparin. Um, and sometimes even treating them with different types of DOACs as well. So it's important to remember anticoagulation is very important for these individuals, especially if they have a hypercoagulable condition underlying there. And then again, if they have um, risk, so let's say that this person has atrial fibrillation. So they have atrial fibrillation that is causing their ischemic infarct. You don't want to give them 
um, that anticoagulation while they're bleeding. You want to give it time. You need to give the person time for that bleed to heal. So for AFib, you might start this maybe, you know, two months to three months later, uh, you'll start their anticoagulation. But you definitely want to restart that. And the reason why is if they go on and develop an ischemic infarct, they're gonna develop a stroke because of that. So you wanna anticoagulate them if they have some type of cardioembolic source, I'm just putting AFib as, as an example here, sometime later after their bleed heals and it starts to clear some of that clot, you wanna put them back on their anticoagulation if they were on that, okay? But give it some time for that bleed to heal and recover before you do that. The next thing that I want us to think about, let's just keep the blue marker here, is infective endocarditis. That was a potential cause, right? So infective endocarditis. What do you do for this? Antibiotics, right? So you're gonna put these individuals on broad spectrum antibiotics until you obtain their blood cultures and find out what exactly they're on. So maybe start them on vancomycin and cefepime and then adjust based upon whatever comes back um, from their blood cultures, okay? So that, and then sometimes infective endocarditis, if it causes mycotic aneurysms, sometimes there is potential ind uh, indication for coiling. So coiling that actual area where the mycotic aneurysm is to prevent that from continuously bleeding into that cerebral tissue. Okay, last but not least is vascular abnormalities. So, you know, that goes back to your vasculitides, that goes back to your AVMs and things like that. The big one that I want you to remember is the AVM. So AVMs, sometimes you don't touch them, you don't even mess with them, but if they're really becoming problematic, what you can do is you can actually develop kind of, you can literally clot off the blood flow to these, uh, these AVMs and so cause these little AVMs to pretty much like die down so they're not even getting, any blood's even going to them anymore. So that way if you, know, if, you, if you develop kind of another brief rise in pressure sometime in the future, you don't rupture those anymore because again, we're embolizing them so that no more blood actually goes to these AVMs. So sometimes there may be an indication for what's called AVM embolization and that will cover everything that we need to know about intracerebral hemorrhage.